So if we reject the law, it's the same as rejecting the Son. The rejection of the Son is the same as the rejection of the Father. We are on the very verge of the final conflict and the world needs to be warned. This movement is not to form separate congregations. This movement is to infuse all. So the world is seeing revolt. Well, who's engineering these events? It's not just happening in the Arab world. It's happening in Europe. It's going to come here. People are fed up with everything that's going on in this world. And this is the breach that needs to be repaired in the time that we live in. We can study prophecies, we can know what's happening in the world, we can see all of these things. If we don't start right here with Jesus, we've gone nowhere. The title of this lecture, Get Away From The Tents, well, it's with a heavy heart that we even have to approach such subjects. But I want to be on a sound footing, and I want to be Bible-based, spirit of prophecy-based. You know, throughout history, God has chosen people whom he brought into connection with himself to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him and to herald the gospel of salvation to a dying world. And he has chosen some here and some there. Nehemiah 9 verse 7 says, Thou art the Lord God who didst choose Abraham and brought him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gavest him the name Abraham. Psalms 135 verse 4, For the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. And he had them as a people. They were supposed to, well, spread the fragrance of God and not to become inclusive. Deuteronomy 7.7 7 says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. And 7 verse 8 says, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondsmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, it says in Exodus 19.5, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. This is the way God has worked throughout the ages. He calls them in Deuteronomy 14.2, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth. So he makes a difference between the harborers of his grace, the harborers of his word, the spreaders of his gospel, and the others. Now, in New Testament times, these promises were transferred to the church, and the church became the herald of salvation. And it went to the Gentiles. And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And we read in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I mean, that's pretty clear. Who gave himself for us, says Titus 2, verse 14, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So he makes a distinction between the people that correspond or listen to his call and those that they don't. So before the close of probation, the final message of warning and hope will be heralded to those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This is biblical. This is prophetic. 
And we read in the spirit of prophecy, Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. But the great cleaver of truth, by the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out of the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man, have been committed to them to be given to the world. And in the accomplishment of this work, our publishing houses are among the most effective agencies. We have to get the truth out there. Not to search for the truth out there. We have to get the truth out there. Our mission is to give to the world the message of warning and mercy, and not a message which is contrary to those precepts. Now, the spirit of prophecy is part of our identity and is not to be marginalized. Everybody's afraid to speak about the spirit of prophecy because it could be divisive. Use it perhaps as... Uh, <laughs> you know, home devotional or something like that, but please stay away from the exegetical. New believers are to have a clear understanding as the end draws near and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies, not less which God in his providence has linked with the work of the third angel's message from its very rise. And if we look at the present day instruction in ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles, and in the last days he speaks to them by the testimonies. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. So I assume if you... Study the testimonies and see the admonitions and the warnings. We better take heed. I am instructed to say that Seventh-day Adventists the world over, God has called us as a people to be a peculiar treasure unto himself. He has appointed that his church on earth shall stand perfectly united in spirit and counsel of the Lord of hosts to the end of time. So this is God's people. Make no mistake, no matter what happens in here, we've spoken about the typologies of apostasy in ancient Israel, and we are repeating that history. There's no doubt about that. During ages of spiritual darkness, the church of God has been as a city set on a hill. From age to age, through successive generations, the pure doctrines of heaven, the what? Pure doctrines of heaven have been unfolding within its borders. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. This is the mission of the church. Ancient Israel was to bring the people into this relationship with God. Ruth had to leave the Moabites behind and say, your God is my God and your people are my people. There's a call out. The Redeemer of the world does not sanction experience and exercise in religious matters independent of his organized and acknowledged church. So I want to be on record to say I believe this is God's remnant church. And as I've said in my previous lectures, buy glue, stick it there, set. But, Daniel 11 verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace, that's the king of the north, between the seas, and the King James Version says, in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Is it possible that Babylonian concepts and papal doctrines will so 
come into the church that this power has planted his tabernacle in God's very church? Is it possible? At this time, when we are so near the end, shall we become so like the world in practice that men may look in vain to find God's denominated people? Shall any man sell our peculiar characteristics as God's chosen people for an advantage the world has to give? Shall the favor of those who transgress the law of God be looked upon as of great value? The favor of those who transgress God's law be looked upon as of great value? Shall those whom the Lord has named these people suppose that there is any power higher than the great I am? Shall we endeavor to blot out the distinguishing points of faith that has made us Seventh-day Adventists? I don't think so. If God wants a message out there, he will certainly <laughs> not enjoy it if somebody tries to derogatize it. We are to give to the world a manifestation of the pure, noble, holy principles that are to distinguish the people of God from the world. Instead of the people of God becoming less and less definitely distinguished from those who do not keep the seventh-day Sabbath, that are to make these points more prominent, not less prominent. And then we are called to expose the man of sin. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin, who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power. As one of the deans of theology of one of our largest universities, in the world told me personally that this is not necessary. And I said to him, excuse me, why not? He said, we don't need it. It's not part of the 27 at that stage, fundamental beliefs. I thought about that a little while and later I had an opportunity to say to him, you know, we do have a fundamental belief that says we believe in the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy says he has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin, so I'm afraid it's in the fundamental beliefs whether you like it or not. Three messages to be combined. The three angels' messages are to be combined, giving their threefold light to the world. I saw another angel. We know the messages, having angel coming down and the earth was lighted with his glory. This is the proclamation of all three messages in the loud cry of the third angel's message. The terrible picture drawn by John, this is in the apocalypse, shown to show how completely the powers of earth will give themselves over to evil should show those who have received the truth how dangerous it is to link up with secret societies or to join themselves in any way with those who do not keep God's commandments. I'm told over and over again that uh, the lectures on secret societies are nothing other than conspiracy theories and that we should dispense with that because it has nothing to do with our prophetic message. But here we read that the whole of Revelation will tell God's people to steer clear of secret societies. And then they still mention the Masons, by name. And there's admonition after admonition as to what these agencies will accomplish at the end of time. So it's part of the message. Who must, who must we obey? Must we obey God's word? Must we obey man's word? That is a complicated decision. So we are told that in spite of these more warnings, many will set their face to do precisely what they were warned not to do. Be not deceived, seven manuscripts release. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The amiga will be of a most startling nature. Do not remain in the fog of skepticism until it's too late for you to find your bearings. We need entire consecration to God. And we don't need 
vain, foolish suppositions and imaginations. What does the word say? That is what our faith is to be based on. Now let's investigate this a little bit further. In the Alpha Apostasy, John Harvey Kellogg, the medical doctor, had introduced pantheistic ideas in his book titled The Living Temple. He tried to bring these ideas into the mainstream of Adventist thinking, and Ellen White counted these ideas. Christ came to the world as a personal savior, not some panthe pantheistic fusion into everything. He represented a personal God. He ascended on high as a personal savior, and he will come again as he ascended to heaven, a personal savior. We need carefully to consider this, for in their human wisdom, the wise men of the world, knowing not God, foolishly deify nature and the laws of nature, and they make him an essence that infuses everything. Now, God's people were warned against this. Do you think the devil will leave it there? Or will he bring in pantheism in a new guise, pretending it is something else? If the alpha, alpha was that kind of thing, then the omega will be the same. So the omega apostasy must be of a similar nature, just more sophisticated and more dangerous. Every form of evil is waiting for an opportunity to assail us. Flattery, bribes, inducements, promises of wonderful exaltation will be most assiduously employed. What are God's servants doing to raise the barrier of a thus says the Lord against this evil. The enemy's agents are working increasingly to prevail against the truth. Where are the faithful guardians of the Lord's flock? Where are his watchmen? We should be wide awake. So today there are indeed moves afoot to bring in a sophisticated new spirituality into the ranks of Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, what is this going to do? It's an expansion of the Alpha apostasy, and it embraces something that is more dangerous, which is called panentheism. The first time I ever heard someone publicly take that stand, it was one of the deans of one of our largest universities, a medical doctor again, who publicly pronounced panentheism and embraced it. And it, it shook me to the foundations. I couldn't believe that it had such a foothold. And there were so many sympathizers. It was unbelievable. Let's see what the dictionary says about this. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology defines panentheism as a worldview that combines the strengths of classic theism with the strengths of classic pantheism. With pantheism, you still have a person, with panentheism, you still have a personal God, theism, coupled with God's pervasive presence in all creation, pantheism. So God is in everyone. God is inspiring everyone. Well, then God must be inspiring the devil as well. In other words, with panentheism, God is both a personality and an all-encompassing substance, as opposed to God being an impersonal substance that incorporates all of creation as found in pantheism. This is far more dangerous. This is so subtle because now you can hide behind your personal deity. You just redefine him. But we know we have a personal deity and we have nothing to do with pantheism. So if God is in everything, then God must also be in Satan, as I've said already, and his followers. And then this cosmic fusion that they want can actually become a reality because then we're all brethren. Doesn't the Bible make a distinct distinction between brethren and neighbors? The only safeguard against such ideas obviously lies in an adherence to it is written. The word must be the norm and not feelings or emotions. 
because these religions are often associated with emotions. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Luke 10, 25. And the answer, he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? That's the answer. What must I do? What is written? But Satan works ingeniously by first diverting the mind from the substance to the feeling. And then he infuses his own doctrine to introduce a new spirituality. The consequence is invariably rebellion against the existing order. That's what you will have. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Here is a spirituality that embraces all of these things. Popular, popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination. So if you have to start imagining, then become weary already. By exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling, converts thus gained have little desire to listen to the Bible truth because they have another standard. They have interior locutions. They have feelings that tell them, oh, the Spirit is leading me in this direction. Dangerous ground, stay off that ground. What does the Bible say? Little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, there's no attraction for them. A message which appeals to the unimpassioned reasons awakens no response. God says, come, let us reason together. Paul says it, even when you're singing, don't blot out your mind, but sing with your mind as well, so that you can sing sensibly, properly, and reverently to God about things that are real, and not just some emotional that hypnotizes you until your, your eyes rotate like a merry-go-round. Now, Let's have a look at the lesson from ancient Israel. Numbers 16, 24, speak unto the congregation, saying, get up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dayton, and Abiram. Now, we've spoken about this issue before, but let's look at it in this context now. The new King James says, get away from the tents of Korah, Dayton, and Abiram. Get away from the tents. That doesn't mean they had to leave Israel. They had to stand aside and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were swallowed up. They disappeared. But the people had to get away from the tents. Get away from them. Get away from this theology. Otherwise, you could end up being swallowed up. This movement was led by whom? It was led by the princes of Israel. So in the antitype, can they again be led by the princes of Israel? It consisted in turning their backs on the way God had led through the prophets and they demanded a new direction. Can it mean that the, many of the leaders will turn their backs on the spirit of prophecy and take the church in another direction? The whole congregation was holy and Korah, Dathan and Abiram, there presented itself a new spiritual and political union which would sweep away the oppression of the old regime. And these are the dangers that we are facing here. If the whole congregation is holy, that means that everybody is infused by the Spirit of God. Now, isn't that a form of pantheism? And if you have still a personal deity, don't you then have a form of panentheism? 2 Corinthians 11:19 says, For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. I think that's so clever. We become cleverer than the word of God. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. As you might have noticed, I like Martin Luther. And I'm going to quote him again. He says, Bad preachers have this luck that one bears and tolerates their folly even if one understands and feels that they are fools. 
Even more so, one credits it to them for good. The true preacher, however, can do nothing right. Rather, one scrutinizes all their works, words and works to see if one can trip them up and if one can find a splinter. It is magnified to a vain log. There is no tolerance, only vain judgment, damnation and scorn. Therefore, it is a miserable office to be a preacher. And it is impossible to persevere in it if one does not perceive it to be to the honor of God and the benefit of one's neighbors. He must work and others must have the benefit and the honor. He, however, must bear loss and mocking as his reward. Here is required love, but not enjoyment, without permitting it to create depression. God's spirit must accomplish this flesh and blood are incapable of achieving it. I think he's right. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 17 says, Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. These are serious admonitions in the Bible. So if ancient Israel had walked this road, and it seems that we are repeating their folly. And the spirit of prophecy says we do it better than they did. Ezekiel 34 verse 5, And they were scattered there because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. My flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. And none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be meat for them. These are serious warnings. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As the shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. May the Lord help the shepherds of his flock not to scatter, but to gather. Now let us see where this is all heading to. Well, this is ChristianityToday.com. I mean, that's, that's important amongst evangelical Christianity today. And they're talking about the emergent mystique. The emerging church movement has generated a lot of excitement, but only a handful of congregations. You see, this movement is not to form separate congregations. This movement is to infuse all. Is it the wave of the future or a passing fancy? They write, a growing number of churches are going, joining the ranks of the emerging church. Like all labels, this one conceals as much as it reveals. This is their own web page. Christianity today. But the phrase emerging church captures several important features of a new generation of churches. They are works in progress often startlingly improvisational in their approach to everything from worship to leadership to preaching to prayer. Like their own members, they live in the half-future tense of the young, orientated towards their promise rather than their past, cultural relevance. It's a cultural jump for our friends to come to the church. It's a cultural jump for us. We grew up in the church, and they talk about the music and all of these things. It's a very often loud form of worship. The great brain behind the emergent church is Brian McLaren. And uh, he is basically considered the father of the emerging church movement. And here is another 
uh, article from Christianity Today, How to Evangelize Today. Brian McLaren, Pastors Inside the Beltway at Cedar Ridge Community Church in Spencerville, Maryland. And he's also of the forthcoming book, More Ready Than You Realize, Evangelism and Dance in the Postmodern Matrix, and a featured spe speaker at the National Pastors Convention, etc., etc. So that's how it evolved. Now, here's the webpage. I would like to ask them, well, what does it entail and what do they teach? From New Begin, which is this organization, McLaren has drawn the idea of the church as missional orientated towards the needs of the world rather than oriented towards its own preservation. So the church is not so important. The needs of the world become important. From Polanyi and McIntyre, he concludes that the emerging church must be monastic. Good grief, what does that mean? Centered on training disciples who practice rather than just believe the faith. He cites Dallas Willard, Richard Foster, with their emphasis on spiritual disciplines as key mentors for the emergent church. So if you read these books and Richard Foster, and I, I have done a whole lecture, and Victor Gill has done a lecture on these issues, then we'll see that these writers are all very prominent in the literature of the Jesuits. And the Jesuit web pages recommend them because they are in tune with Jesuit spirituality. And the spirituality is based on the exercises of Loyola, which is spiritism and nothing else. But these are very important in this new emerging church philosophy. Now, let's see what he believes. He writes, McLaren writes, in More Ready Than You Realize, I believe people are saved not by objective truth, but by Jesus. Now, truth and error mixed together is quite a potent concoction. Now, if you are saved by Jesus, but not by objective truth, Let's cut doctrine and truth out because the Bible says thy word is truth. And the Bible says all thy, command, all thy commandments are truth. If you cut those objective truths out, then uh, what kind of Jesus are we talking about? Uh, anything goes Jesus? I don't believe making disciples must equal making adherence to the Christian religion. Thank you. That sums up the issue to me. I may, it may be advisable in many, not all circumstances, to help people become followers of Jesus and remain within their Buddhist, Hindu, or Jewish context. Rather than resolving the paradox via pronouncements on the eternal destiny of people, more convinced by or loyal to other religions than ours, we simply move on. So you don't have to convert a Buddhist from his atheism, according to John Paul II, to the Bible-based Jesus. You don't have to. Leave him where he is. Rather, learn from him. To help Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, and everyone else experience life to the full, these are very important words, we'll see that the Jesuits use this theology. In the way of Jesus, while learning it better myself, I would gladly become one of them, whoever they are. It sounds so Christian. Paul says virtually the same thing, but he doesn't mean it in this sense. Paul would not have left Christianity and become a Buddhist. I would gladly become one of them, to whatever degree I can, to embrace them to join them, to enter into their world without judgment, but with saving love, as mine has been entered by the Lord. It comes from a generous orthodoxy. Then he writes, Western Christianity has, for the last few centuries anyway, said relatively little about mindfulness and meditative practices about which Zen Buddhism has said much. 
To talk about different things is not to contradict one another. It is rather to have much to offer one another on occasion at least. The Bible says, come out and be separate. Do not worship in the way of these peoples. Don't do those things. This man says, let's do it. Uh, Here's a problem. He writes, in generous orthodoxy, we see modernity with its absolutism and colonialism and totalitarianism as a kind of static dream, a desire to abide abide in timeless abstraction and extract humanity from the ongoing flow of history and emergence, a naive hope to make now the end of history, which actually sounds either like a kind of death wish or millennialism. You know, couched in these seemingly innocuous words, he has a damning indictment for those who love doctrine. In Christian theology, this anti-emergent thinking is expressed in systematic theologies that claim overtly, covertly, or unconsciously to have final orthodoxy nailed down, freeze-dried, and shrink-wrapped forever. Forget about your doctrine. That's what he's saying. But the Bible says, take heed of the doctrine. Who must I believe? Must I believe the Bible or must I believe him? He continues in the secret message of Jesus uncovering the truth that could change everything. Jesus seems to say the kingdom of God doesn't need to wait until something else happens. No, it is available amongst you now. Invite people of all nations, races, classes, and religions to participate in this new network of dynamic interactive relationships with God and all his people. You know, this kind of theology was already taught quite early on by some Seventh-day Adventist pastors. And uh, I don't particularly want to mention names, but I was at camp meetings with many of them, and one of them got up and said, we should never go and evangelize the Chinese or any other nation, because right now everyone is saved. Everybody is born saved. And if we evangelize them, we might make them choose the wrong thing and they could get lost, leave them. They're saved as they are. What is the commission? Go ye into all the world then for? We're making fools of ourselves. And he actually said that. He says we're arrogant if we as Adventists think we must preach this message to people. I've heard this many, many years ago already. The kingdom of God he writes, will be radically, scandalously inclusive. As we've seen, Jesus enjoys table fellowship with prostitutes and drunks. He affirms and responds to the faith of Gentiles. I mean, anybody who sits down and thinks about that must know that this is a gross distortion of what Jesus actually did. Instead of being about the kingdom of God coming to earth, wrote McLaren, the Christian religion has too often become preoccupied with abandoning or escaping the earth and going to heaven. What if Jesus' secret message reveals a secret plan, asks Brian McLaren in his new book, The Secret Message of Jesus. What if he didn't come to start a new religion, but rather came to start a political, social, religious, artistic, economic, intellectual, and spiritual revolution that would give birth to a new world? This is fascinating stuff. This is so dangerous. This comes straight from the pits of hell. This man over here, Beret Koyes, I don't know how to pronounce his name, he comments. Now, this is someone out there in the world. He's reading all this stuff and he's saying, stamping out faith in biblical absolutes is central to this transformation. A mind anchored in God's word won't compromise. But when that anchor is removed, the current of change can carry that mind anywhere. As Jesuit scholastic Mark Mosser wrote in his endorsement of Brian McLaren's latest book. Hmm. So who endorses McLaren's theology. The Jesuits. 
So the mind can go anyone. Let's just get rid of the biblical absolutes. Isn't this fascinating? The secret message of Jesus challenges us to put aside our sterile certainties about Christ and reconsider the imaginative world of Jesus' stories, signs, and wonders. We've moved from the realms of the biblical to the realms of the spiritualistic. This is spiritualism. This is demonic. And if the Jesuits are behind it, I can with clarity say this is a counter-reformation movement. Now my question is, what has this to do with Seventh-day Adventists? And sadly, the answer is everything. Here is a web page run by Seventh-day Adventist, Faith House, Manhattan. It was found, founded by Savmi Selmanovic, Mission. We are an experiential, just look at the buzzwords, interreligious community that comes together to deepen our personal and communal journeys, share ritual life and devotional space, and foster a commitment to social justice and the healing of the world. That's their own webpage. Every aspect of emerging church th theology is right in there. Now, Samir Selmanovic is the ordained pastor. This comes from their webpage. I'm just reading. Author, missional entrepreneur, and founder of Faith House Manhattan, an interfaith exploration of faith and spirituality. Currently, he is Christian co-leader for Faith House. Samir, who holds a PhD from Andrews University, served for several years as a teaching pastor at Crosswalk, a Seventh-day Adventist congregation in Southern California. And his book, It's Really All About God, was released by and then tells you about it. He's also an ordained pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and co-founder of ReChurch Network. Here's their webpage, ReChurch Network. He has been integral to the birth of the emerging church movement, serving as a member of the coordinating group of Emergent Village and representing emergence at the Interfaith Relations Commission of the National Council of Churches. Now, just the very name, ReChurch, means let's do it over again. Let's change the church. Let's go from where we were to where we want to be. And if you go to that webpage and you see who all is involved, it seems like a veritable who's who of the theologians at our top universities. We're talking about the big ones. We might as well name them Andrews University. We might as well name them Loma Linda University. Walla Walla, you name it. They're there. And the same spirituality. Now, I'm not suggesting, and please don't misunderstand me, that everybody at these universities is at the same page, because God would never allow it. At every one of our institutions, God has godly people who stand for righteousness and truth. But those that are the most vocal are often the ones that are the most apostate. Let's have a look at this. He writes books, endorsements. Is, is he, Samir uh, is asking the right questions at the right time and refusing the consolation of certain certainty at a time when student orthodoxies, atheists as well as religious, are perilously dividing us. And his book, It's Really All About God, was released by Josie Bass in 2009. And if you go to these webpage and you read the endorsements of many of the leading Adventist scholars, I'm talking about professors at our universities, Andrews University, Loma Linda University, I'm talking about deans of theology. Then you start wondering, and I'm no longer surprised when some of these deans call me in and tell me that I may not preach that the Pope is the Antichrist publicly, 
and when they tell me that we must embrace all the others, and when they tell me that people that come in with the old style message are not welcome in the church, but then it becomes a serious issue. Now here's his book, it's really all about God, and we have to look at some of these issues because we're not talking about one man in obscurity, we're talking about a new spirituality which has taken hold of many of our institutions, and not only our institutions, but it has filtered right down to the grassroots levels as though this were norm. As we ask the question, what is faith? Salmanovic suggests that we move away from the question of eternity to focus on the present and the temporal. This is a very serious thing that he's saying there. Forget about the road that the Bible prescribes. Let's just become involved with the things here. With that in mind, we can receive the word that the pearl of great price that we seek is not Christianity, nor eternity, nor even God's acceptance, but rather it is the kingdom of God, an invitation to learn to love well. Love what well? Love who well? Love how well? Does love well mean giving up the pillars of your faith? Does love well mean becoming disobedient to embrace the disobedient? That is the essence of faith. This is the purpose of life. We learn how to love well. Christianity at its best, as is true of other faith traditions at their best, offer a way of loving well. So we're just one of many. In the prologue he writes, I made it a personal discipline to take trips outside the boundaries of Christianity. I did it first to find out whether my God is on the outside of my religion, woven into all life. What is that? If God is woven into all life, that's pantheism. And second, to look at my religion from the outside in and experience the way my religion, like any other, excludes others. In the process, I've adopted a simple question that helps me navigate the journey. Is a God who favors anyone over anyone else worth worshiping? That's a serious question. In other words, if God calls a peculiar treasure, if he calls people out of the world into his presence in that way, well, he seems to have a problem with a God like that. So my question here is, is this the right question? I know that God loves all people the same, but does he love all religious teachings the same? Does he love a, re a religious teaching that removes the deity of Christ from its presence equally to one that acknowledges it? Is there more than one truth? Is there more than one Jesus? And if so, does it matter? Is he, is he asking the right question? The way religions contradict or collide with one another is not nearly as important to them as the way they complement one another. These are serious things that this man is saying. If God created all humanity, he writes on page 9, but gave life-giving knowledge, usually referred to as revelation to only some of humanity, could God in a meaningful sense be thought of as the one God and not only as a God? Now, you know where I read that before? I read that in the writings of Albert Pike. That's where I read that before, this kind of thinking. This is an occult way of thinking. Wouldn't such a God be historically or geographically local? He's repeating virtually word for word Albert Pike's writings, derogatory writings against the God of the Bible in morals and dogma. This is the same kind of thinking. This is spiritualism. So God must now be redefined. He doesn't have to work, and he may not work like he works in the Bible, but he has to be inclusive, infusing everyone. And therefore I'm not surprised when deans of theology tell me 
That's not how you work with Muslims. They also have the Spirit of God. You leave them where they were. That is their culture. They keep going to the mosque. All they must do is include Jesus, which they already do because they have respect for him. So what's your problem? I said, excuse me. I had to, as a Roman Catholic, leave my cathedral and go to the little church over there. But you're saying that they don't have to leave their cathedrals, their mosques. They can stay right there. Yes, that's exactly what, what, what he's saying. This is fascinating. So now I know where they th how they think. But the Bible says, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So God does use a people to tell others what truth is. If knowing God is a way of life and if God has divided the world, page 10 of his writings, by revelation, let me read that again. If knowing God is a way of life and if God has divided the world by revelation, then the destiny of those who don't have access to a life-giving revelation of God would serve no other purpose than being a control group in a cosmic experiment, a vast human sacrifice. In even more stark terms, Yahweh, Abba, meaning Daddy, a name for God that Jesus affectionately used, or Allah, would not differ from Moloch, an ancient god of destruction reported in the Bible that required human sacrifice for his glory. You see how this man is thinking. We can either stay within the Christianity we have mastered with Jesus, we have domest with the Jesus we have domesticated, or we can leave Christianity as a destination, embrace Christianity as a way of life, and journey to reality where God is present and living in every person, every human community, and all creation. Help me. What is this? This is pantheism, and it's also panentheism. This is what these people are teaching. This is what, what I heard out of their mouths, personal witness at some of the meetings that I've been together. This is spiritism. A new generation of believers wants to find a God who dwells outside the boundaries of their own tradition, a God that would be worth worshipping. So the only one that's worth worshipping is this God that is in everything. I wonder whether he's then in Satanism as well. He must be. Then we have yin-yang philosophy. By virtue of being human, we all have religion of some kind given to us by the community of which we are a part. That's why we need our religious words, symbols, and theologies. However, for our religious sacraments to survive, develop, transform, and serve their purpose in our independent world, we will have to abandon their role as enclosures of God. They are to become gates we can regularly use to help us enter a reality larger than our religion, the precious temple of life. This almost sounds like the title of Kellogg's book, The Living Temple. <laughs> this is the new spirituality. This is the Omega apostasy which has entered into our ranks. And unfortunately, as I have said, if it were here and there someone who has lost the road and everybody would be shouting, whoa, don't go down that road, that would be one thing. But if this spirituality is being embraced on such a broad level that these people become the speakers for our church and anything else is to be excluded, like that dean said to me when I said, but the old truths, the three angels' message is bringing thousands into the church when he says to me, we don't want them. Then we know where we stand. Religious people who worship non-gods, such as church, doctrines, Festivals, rituals, liturgy, laws, habits, or any other religious entity also avoid relating their lives to the whole. He's canning the doctrines. He's saying, throw them in the garbage. 
Either way, their hearts have latched onto an object. Non-God, such as faith or reason, relegate the discussion about what matters to narrow or specialized language, such as salvation or heaven. What is the man saying? Don't preach about salvation. Don't teach about your doctrines. And don't use your mind. Reason. Don't use it. Just go with the flow. This is dangerous. If we don't stand up and warn God's people against this apostasy, then God will hold us accountable if we knew. Believing in God saves us from believing in non-gods. So doctrines and church and all those things and your reason, those are the non-gods. So God has given me a brain for what? Putting it in the waste of a basket and thinking with my stomach? Believing in God saves us from believing in non-gods? That's why atheism is inherent in Christianity. A kind of atheism that questions all our views of God and all our allegiance to religion, and that's one of the reasons we need religions other than our own. And this is the new theology. Now let's look at some of the people who endorse his writings. Because if you find out who says, whoo, this is wonderful, we love it, let's find out who they are. And then you decide whether you want to be bedfellows with the people that endorse this kind of theology. I'm not mentioning the Adventists that endorse it because the list is as long as my arm, including deans of theology and professors and all of those. I'm not going to mention their names. Enough said. But let's look at some of those who are not Adventists who are endorsing it. This is Brian McLaren. I'm speechless in trying to describe this book. I laughed out loud in places and cried big tears at the end. It's a work of faith, a work of art, and to some now doubt it will be a work of damnable heresy. I think this book will change people's lives and more. It can save lives, and in many senses of that word, all the religious pundits and broadcasters on radio and cable TV had better take notice because this book threatens our conventional, comfortable categories and fam familiar black and white polarities. Salmanovic has the nerve to imagine our religions becoming not walls behind which we hide and over which we lob bombs of damnation, but bridges over which we travel to find God in the others. Now you can see why anyone who preaches the three angels' messages must be from the pits of hell, according to these people. Why, if you say God has a peculiar treasure, a peculiar people, you don't fit into the sphere. And sooner or later, the two ideologies, the church that was raised up in 1844, will come into conflict with this ideology. And there has to be a shaking, because the two cannot live side by side. Now, here is his own web page, Salmanovic's web page, and there it says that he has Paul Netter, uh, one of the people with which he co deals, Paul Netter. Now, who are your bedfellows? Paul Netter? <laughs> this is Paul Netter. Paul Tillich, Professor of Theology, World Religion, Cultural Union College, Theological Seminary. I'll get to him a little more just now. I've had it in a previous lecture, but for the sake of clarity, we'll put it in this one as well. This is a delightfully seductive book. In a conversational and imaginatively colorful style, Salmanovic leads the reader gently but engagingly along the steps of his li own life's path to a conclusion that is as clear as it is challenging, that the only God worth believing in cannot be just my or our God for all those committed to creating a truly multi-religious civil society. This book is a gift. There's no calling out here, none whatsoever. Now, Paul Netter, who are you? Paul Netter, the Paul Tillich Professor of Theology, World Religions and Culture at Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, is a leading theologian of religious pluralism and interreligious dialogue. 
He's the author of more than a dozen books. Most recently, without Buddha, I could not be a Christian. So according to John Paul II, without atheism, without that religious system, I couldn't be a Christian. Netta's journey into interfaith dialogue began in 1964 when he was a seminarian in Rome and experienced the Second Vatican Council firsthand at a time when the Roman Catholic Church declared its new attitude towards other religions. But it redefined it in its fine print saying, we haven't changed at all. We've only duped you into thinking we've changed. His famous book, No Other Name, tells us who he studied under. That's what he looked like then. That's what he looks like now. He's obviously gained experience. He served as divine word missionary before assuming a position at Xavier University. And there he was professor of theology. Now he's changed again, as you see. He received his doctorate where? From the pontifical Gregorian University. Who was his mentor? Karl Rana, the top Jesuit who was to bring this new way of thinking to the entire world. Okay, so you're Jesuit trained. You're a Jesuit. And here is the, the back of his book, No Other Name. He faces honestly the conundrum of what committed Christian believers does theologically in the face of growing evidence, scholarly and from personal encounter. No Bible there that there are other ways, religious ways, of leading a full, authentic human life than the Christian way. Can a person be saved that he's come to live a truly human life? And I've mentioned this in a previous lecture. Let's mention it again. That's a redefinition of salvation. Since when is salvation living a truly human life? By some other name than that of Jesus? And then he answers it, yes. You can. This is first-rate creative theology. And I said in that lecture, and I'll say it again, that's the only true sentence in this document there. It is very creative, but it's not biblical, and it's a lie, because the Bible says there is no other name. All right, so Jesuit endorsement. Let's look at this man. Why not look at him, Richard Raw? And this is what he writes about it. Why are thousands not saying what this man is saying? Such obvious truth must be made even more obvious. And this is exactly what Sarmi Selmanovic is doing for all of us and for the future of humanity. After you read this wise book, you will say, of course, and thank God. Who is this man? Roman Catholic priest. He prayers of the liturgy and the Eucharist. He opens his prayer with Father, Mother, God. Raw's preface to our Father by saying, and now knowing we are more than one, than we are many, though we come from different places and races, we all share the same Father, Mother, God. This is Rome. This is the King of the North. And he is overjoyed that he has placed his tents in. God's holy mountain. This theology comes from beneath and not from above. And this man, Professor Marcus Bork, writes and endorses the same book together with all the Adventists, a remarkable book that combines memoir, insight, wisdom, passion, and compassion. Marcus Book, author, meeting Jesus again for the first time, the heart of Christianity and Jesus uncovering the life teaching and relevant of a religious revolutionary. And let us have a look at what he has to say and then you can understand what strange bedfellows are excited about this. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but I have absolutely no idea if it involved anything happening to his corpse. I think it's quite possible that his body was eaten by dogs and that there was never even a full tomb to say nothing of an empty tomb. But my basic claim here is that resurrection does not need to involve something happening to a corpse. How I understand the resurrection of Jesus is that the followers of Jesus continued to experience him as a living reality after his death. 
if you listen to the theology of these people, I have only one word for it, disgusting. As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock and they will yield to temptation. And those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will under one pretext or another go out from us. So we know there must be different ideologies in our church. The truth must not be merged and marginalized, but must be made prominent. We are not to make less prominent the special truths that have separated us from the world. Have what? Separated us from the world and made us what we are, for they are fraught with eternal interest. God has given us light in regard to the things that are now taking place. And with pen and voice, we are to proclaim the truth to the world. Those who stand as teachers and leaders in our institutions are to be sound in faith and in the principles of the third angel's message. God wants his people to know, now note carefully, that we have the message as he gave it to us in 1843 and 1844. That's the message. The truths that we received in 1841, 1842, 1843, 1844, are now to be studied and proclaimed. The messages of the first, second, and third angels' message, angels will in future be proclaimed with a loud voice. They will be given with earnest determination and in the power of the Spirit. I am fascinated to see how God raised up organizations to spread this message, the three angels' messages, in spite of what's happening in the church. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. Isn't this pretty clear? So if you reject that, you must reject the entire spirit of prophecy. All the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. The message was given and there should be no delay in repeating the message. For the signs of the times of fulfilling the closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. That's Adventism. This other stuff is not Adventism. The truth for this time is to be proclaimed in all parts of the world. If men and women fail to act their part, God will give voices to the stones. And in the previous lectures we held, I let the stones cry out. I put them on the board. And I said, look at what these people are saying. They can see something wrong with it, but our people can't. Have we lost our mind? May God help us to give the stirring message for this time. We have no time now to amuse ourselves with the enemy's sophistry or to apologize for his work. My brethren, keep off Satan's ground. Do not tamper with what you ought to denounce firmly and boldly in words, the meaning of which cannot be mistaken. Speak about it. If you tamper with that which you ought to denounce, you will fall victims to your own ignorance and folly. You can have nothing to do with it. The enemy of souls has thought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place amongst Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. I never hear these people speak about Rome. I never hear them speak about the beast. I never hear them speak about the mark of the beast. I never hear them speak about the image of the beast. I never hear them speak about the prophecies of Daniel. I never hear them speak about the prophecies of Revelation. It's all airy-fairy spirituality. That's all it is. 
A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. I think we've just seen some of the extracts of books of a new order and a new spirituality. But we are warned. These people will be powerful. So there must be princes involved. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. It's not possible. It's not possible for the messages that went out in the early days of this church to be reconciled with the spirituality. It has to lead to a clash. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. They'll tell you that the messages of the three angels are divisive because people will be herded into camps. Who has authority to begin such a movement? We have our own Bibles. We have our experience attested to by the miraculous workings of the Holy Spirit. We have a truth that admits of no compromise. Shall we not repudiate everything that is not in harmony with this truth? Get rid of it. Suffer not yourselves to open the lids of a book that is questionable. Hmm. There is a hellish fascination in the literature of Satan. It is the powerful battery by which he tears down a simple religious faith. Never feel that you are strong enough to read infidel books. Now people will say to me, excuse me, Walter White, don't you quote at nausea from infidel books? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. She says in another place, some people might read those books, but let me tell you where I come from. I come from that infidel world. I was steeped in that infidel literature. I was trained by my occultist father-in-law, who was a fine person, one of the finest persons I've ever known. But he was an occultist, and he trained me. And that which I discovered later is like gold to me now. And I abhor that which I read and knew before. I am not reading or quoting these books to find some tasty morsel that I can internalize. It makes me want to throw up. Others have said it, so why couldn't I say that too? I am using it to warn God's people to stay off that ground, to take out a text here and a text there to show them that it's not in harmony with God's word. I would never suggest to anyone, go and read Albert Pike's book. It's steeped in mysticism. Don't go and read Blavatsky. How people tell me, who's Blavatsky? She's not important. They haven't got an idea. If you read Blavatsky in the occult world, you have arrived. She is the counter of Ellen G. White. She is, to faithful Adventists, Ellen White is to faithful Adventists what Blavatsky is to the occult world. So I would not suggest that anyone reads these books, never feel that you are strong enough to read infidel books for they contain a poison like that of asps. So if you think that you can read the books of Richard Foster, which are steeped in Jesuit philosophy, you are reading straight from the pits of hell. Why do you want to be confused by books like that? Why would you want to take books like that and discover a spirituality which some people think is on a par with the spirit of prophecy? Good grief. They are as far removed as the East is from the West. They can do you no good and will assuredly do you harm. In reading them, you are inhaling the miasmas of hell. I'm not saying this even. This is the spirit of prophecy. 
They will be to your soul like a corrupt stream of water defiling the mind, keeping it in the mazes of skepticism and making it earthly and sensual. These books are written by men whom Satan employs as his agents. That's powerful stuff. If this new spirituality is true, well, then you would be perhaps inclined to say that all these books that are coming out are inspired by God because it's leading people to one unity. Here's another book, Hunger. Written by whom? John Dibdahl is the former president of Walla Walla University and a current adjunct professor and demon program at Andrews University. What does it do? It propagates centering down, breath prayers, Lectio Divina, and Jesus prayers, which should be repeated about 3,000 times. 3,000 times. Say the word Jesus 3,000 times. You know, if you say the word Jesus 3,000 times, you'll get God's attention. Did you know that? He'll say, oh, look at my servant down there. He said my name 3,000 times. I better pay attention. What is it you want? Try it with your wife. Go and repeat the name of your wife 3,000 times to get your attention. You'll get a pan on your head. Bong! Like we've gone insane. Say it once. What do you want to know? This is ludicrous. All of which are hypnotic techniques induced by repetitiveness. Ellen White says, his name is to be revered. Reverence should be shown also for the name of God. Never should that name be spoken lightly or thoughtlessly. Even in prayer, its frequent or needless repetition should be avoided. We don't need to be heathens and to repeat over and over until our eyeballs turn upside down in their sockets and we go off into some imaginative rail. This is the Crossroads Initiative, a Roman Catholic website. Benedict reflects on De Verbum Lectio Divina, divine reading. Now that's not reading and studying your Bible. That is using your Bible like an occult tool. And normally you chant it or you sing it and you read not so much to internalize the message that is there, but to repeat the words in a particular fashion. The same is true for reading the Quran. People have to sing the Quran. And the singers, the better they are, the higher their positions at the mosques. You have to have a certain intonation. How the word is said, how it rolls on the tongue is more important than what the word means. That's Lectio Divina. This is spiritism. And this is Pope Benedict. In this context, I would like in particular to recall and recommend the ancient tradition of Lectio Divina. Well, shouldn't our people know if it's something comes out of the mouth of the Pope, it comes out of the mouth of the Antichrist? The diligent reading of sacred scripture accompanied by prayer brings about the intimate dialogue in which the person reading hears God who is speaking and in praying responds to him with trusting openness of heart. Dei verbum. It is effectively promoted if if it is effectively promoted, this practice will bring to the church, I'm convinced of it, a new spiritual springtime. This is spiritism. As a strong point of biblical ministry, Lectio Divina should therefore be increasingly encouraged also through the use of new methods, carefully thought through and in step with the times. I should never, it should never be forgotten that the word of God is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. How deceptive. So you use the word of God, but you use it as an instrument of hypnotism and not to discern what God has said. I was surprised to see that uh, some of the far right proponents that claim that this church is Babylon say that I use Lectio Divina when I talk about typology. This is most confusing to me and most interesting and that I might be a clandestine Jesuit because I use 
the Bible typologically. The experience of the past will be repeated. In the future, Satan's suppositions, superstitions will assume new forms. Errors will be presented in a pleasing and flattering manner. False theories closed with garments of light will be presented to God's people. Thus, Satan will try to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Most seducing influences will be exerted. Minds will be, what's that word? Hypnotized. That's what these breath prayers are for. And you breathe in and you breathe out and you use syllables over and over and over and over again until you're hypnotized. And then Satan appears to you like an angel of light. And you hear the voices. And you have a new spirituality and you have a spiritual formation and you become totally obedient to your hypnotist. And we've had this for a long time in our church already. This is not some new thing. This has been creeping in. And it started off with NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, lab one, lab two. And we started drawing this in. And Loveless and people like that started preaching that Ellen White was just a mistake. Good grief. Where are we coming from? When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hand of spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous workings of Satan and that the end is near. Now my question is, when we start inviting Jesuits and leaders of the ecumenical movement as guest speakers to our campuses, churches, and spiritual meetings, then the end must be even nearer, if it's even in our own ranks. Here's another interesting book, The Green Core Dream written by Alex Bryan, and it's written about Ellen White's dream of the green cord. But it is so deceptive. He is senior pastor at Walla Walla University Campus Church. He used to have a church that even kept Sunday for a while, which was, according to what I hear, a rather uh, loud church, if I may say so. He writes, the Adventist movement was born in failure rather than success, error rather than truth, darkness rather than light. That's quite scary. Of course, he's talking about the great disappointment. And then, if we take Jesus seriously, recognizing that he has jurisdiction and life or death power over every human being, then we should see another as fellow citizens, subjects of the same kingdom. Isn't that the same theology? These people writing new books of a new order, switching metaphors. If all of us are children of God because he created all of us, then we are siblings. Are we Christians or a cult? Are we a separate body of Christ, or does Christ have, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians and 1 and Ephesians 4, only one body? So the doctrine of come out and be separate is gone. Spiritual formation becomes the norm. That's Jesuit theology. You know, I hear people say over and over again, oh, but we don't do it like that, like the Jesuits. We don't do it like that. We do it differently. Yes, we package it in nice Adventist terminology and present it in a different way. You know, if I package arsenic in a nice bottle, does it become drinkable? Just by packaging something which is not from God in a nice Adventist package makes it just as much evil as if it were preached forthrightly and openly. Adventism has something in particular to say to the whole of Christianity, a message unique to us. But we are brothers and sisters of all Christians around the world who proclaim Jesus as the Christ. There's no distinction anymore. So they want to still have their flavor, 
but uh, they want to mingle it. We haven't been given the authority to delegitimize the sonship, daughtership, siblingship of Christ's followers who differ from us in belief and behavior. Adventists can be true to their John the Baptist calling while sitting at the Thanksgiving table with Christian brothers and sisters. As Adventist Christians engage the world, we do so viewing others not as the enemy, but as beloved siblings whom we hope will come to know God. But if you stand against it and you preach from the perce perception of come out and be separate, well, then you will be seen as an enemy and you will be seen as unloving and you will be seen as someone who doesn't care. Do I care about all the other religions out there? I wouldn't be preaching my self into a coma if I didn't care about others. Of course I care about others. That's what we do. We preach to others. We befriend them. But we have to bring them from darkness into light. Helen White uses just one line to talk about Hinduism. One line. That's all. As useless to save as the gods of the Hindus. That tells me I have a mission to go to them and try and reach them. That's why some, some of us have a compassion and a, a pressing desire to go and reach out to these people, to go to India, to preach the great truths of the gospel. That doesn't mean that you are saying, let's go to the Hindus because they can teach us much about how to worship. Now, Adventist Media Center, West Coast Worship Conference. And I want to ask some questions. Now, these are some of the official web pages, and I know I'm in trouble. I know that I'm in big trouble, but here goes. Why is it that the speakers, many of them interdenominational, at our large worship conferences, are largely in the spiritual formation and emerging school, church school of thought? Why is it that when these things are organized internationally, the speakers come from that camp? Why are the speakers not from the Three Angels message camp? Oh, we can't have them. Or the One Project, the Gathering. And, you know, these are official web pages. I'm treading on very dangerous ground here. North America, Europe. Australia, the one project, Jesus, all celebrating the supremacy of Jesus in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And when you look at the speakers, you find that they're from the same camps. Is, is there such a pressing need to put this new spirituality out there in the marketplace? Now, it's interesting, there's another web page, which is not Adventist, The One Project, with exactly the same name. And the same name, let's look at what they say. The One Project is about connection. The One Project is about change. It's about worship. Seems like a bedlam of noise to me. Our mission is to unite the churches of the body of Jesus Christ through this generation of young men and women by strengthening one another in our faith, by encouraging one another through our friendship, and by compelling one another in our love and service towards the kingdom of God. They're building a kingdom. But this kingdom is of this world. And we had the lecture about the seven mountains I find it interesting that Rome sits on seven mountains and she wants to have control over this final kingdom. So the same mindset in this way of thinking as in our own ranks. And it seems that nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of this spirituality. Because there's only one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all of us, who is above all and through all and in you all. But this all embraces everyone. 
and not just those that have been called. We need as a people to separate ourselves from these thoughts and directions and to rediscover the ancient paths. And if we don't, we will go down into this abyss that opened up in the days of Korah. Because my people have forgotten me, they have burnt incense to vanity and they have caused them to stumble in their way from the ancient paths, to walk in paths in a way not cast up. We as Seventh-day Adventists must get back to those paths. God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak. How? Their work shall follow them. We are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work. Let that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. Why is this stuff not reproduced? Why are we hiding? We are now to understand what the pillars of our faith are. And brothers and sisters, this new spirituality is drawing us away from God. The great waymarks of truth showing us our bearings in prophetic history are to be carefully guarded, lest they be torn down and replaced with theories that would bring confusion rather than genuine light. What we need, the prophecies of Daniel and John are to be diligently studied. Not some gaga spirituality. Listen not a moment to the interpretations that would loosen one pin, remove one pillar from the platform of truth. Not one. Study diligently the third chapter of Revelation. In it is pointed out the danger of losing your hold upon the things that you have heard and learnt from the source of light. We are on a dangerous slippery slope. And then protest when they remove the landmarks, when they start telling you, you cannot use the spirit of prophecy for exegesis, you can only use it for homiletics. That's dangerous. Because then you can throw the great controversy into the waste paper basket. Because it is exegesis. It tells you what the mark of the beast is. It tells you what the image of the beast is. It tells you who the beast is. Isn't that exegesis? Isn't that telling you what the text says? When men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who are pioneers in our work speak plainly, and let those who are dead speak also by the reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. And if it takes media to do it, then use the media. Then we are referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five were foolish. We need to study that because we are in that very time. Of all the virgins that followed Christ in 1844, only a handful followed him into the most holy. It was whittled down from 50,000 to 50. Thousands turned their backs and the door closed for those that had rejected the light, they lacked sufficient oil. And I'm afraid history is going to be repeated. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. What is the image of the beast and how is it to be formed? The image is made by the two-horned beast and is an image of the beast. And then we will say, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. Is that calling a spade a spade? That's our message. If we don't warn the people, then we will embrace these Paul Knitters and other theologians with their asp poison of Jesuit theology. And we will embrace it and place it in a new spirituality in a beautiful setting and nothing will be allowed to stand in its path. Apostasy will lead to national ruin. When the mark of the beast and these things are implemented, then there will be national rooms. There are many who have never had the light. They are deceived by the teachers and they have not received the mark of the beast. So we need to warn them. 
How? With this new spirituality of learning from each other and embracing one another? No confederacy should be formed with unbelievers. Neither should you call together a certain chosen number who think as you do and who will say amen to all that you propose while others are excluded. Who do you think will, who you think will not be in harmony? I was shown that there was great danger in doing this. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. The Bible calls such unions behind the scenes in the world out there a confederacy. Today we use the word conspiracy and we dump it in the waste paper basket. Yes, some conspiracy theories belong in the waste paper basket. But those which show how the powers behind the scenes align themselves in accordance to biblical prophecy should warn God's people that the time is at hand. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If Paul Netter says there is another way, and the Bible says there is no other way, who am I supposed to believe? In every age since the fall of Adam, the opposition of evil agencies has made the lives of those who would be loyal and true to God's commandment a continual warfare. Brothers and sisters, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough. Because between light and darkness, there can be no compromise. The state of corruption and apostasy that in the last days would exist in the religious world was presented to the prophet John in the vision of Babylon. So the world out there is not this enlightened group infused by the Spirit of God, but it is the vision of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. There must be a marked separation from sin and sinners. There can be no compromise between God and the world. This is a totally different message. Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled, yet the time is passing and the people are asleep. They refuse to humble their souls and to be converted. Not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have such great and important truths revealed to them, but who refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience. Now is the time to start making serious attempts to come into harmony with God's word. Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity, for they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see, and as for me also, my eye will not spare, nor will I pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own heads. Just then the man clothed with linen who had the ink horn at his side reported back and said, I have done as you commanded me. Second selected messages quoting this text. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization for this would mean apostasy from the truth. No people are saved because they have great light and special advantages, for these high and heavenly favors only increase their responsibility. Do you know what position we are in? When Jerusalem was divorced from God, it was because of her sins. She sh fell from an exalted height that Tyre and Sidon had never reached. And when an angel falls, he becomes a fiend. These are dangerous words. The depth of our ruin is measured by the exalted light to which God has raised us in his great goodness and unspeakable mercy. Oh, what privileges are granted to us as a people. And if God spared not his people that he loved because they refused to walk in the light, how can he spare the people whom he has blessed with light of heaven in having opened to them the most exalted truth ever entrusted to mortal man to give to the world? If our church is going to permit this great apostasy to take place in our very midst. What an account will we have to give? 
Those who keep God's commandments, those who live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, compose the church of the living God. This is the one, the God commandment keeping people. The sin of ancient Israel was in disregarding the expressed will of God and following their own way according to the leadings of unsanctified heart. Modern Israel is fast following in their footsteps and the displeasure of the Lord is surely resting upon them. Talking about us. The leaders of the people yielded to the temptation of Satan. The experience will be repeated in the last years of the history of the people of God. Not me saying this. This is the spirit of prophecy. And I'll tell you why I use so many spirit of prophecy quotes. Because it will be said, you are saying this. You are causing division. You are divisive. Is this divisive? The experience will be repeated in the last years of the history of the people of God. Men whom he has greatly honored will in the closing scenes of this history history pattern after ancient Israel. There are men amongst us in responsible positions who hold that the opinions of a few conceited philosophers so-called are more to be trusted than the truth of the Bible or the testimonies of the Holy Spirit. Every single word that is written here tells us what will come into the church. And when I look at the church, I see them all here. Now, have I gone mad? Or is the spirit of prophecy mad? Or are we sane and the rest is insane? People must make their choices. God has shown me that these men are Hazael's to prove a scourge to our people. They are wise above what is written, this unbelief of the very truths of God's word because human judgment cannot comprehend the mysteries of his work is found in every distinct district in all ranks of society. It is taught in most of our schools and comes into the lessons of the nurseries. Thousands who profess to be Christians give heed to lying spirits. Everywhere the spirit of darkness and the garb of religion will confront you. We are told it's coming. And now, we are not to spend our time in controversy with those who know the truth and upon whom the light of truth has been shining when they turn away their ears from the truth to turn to fables. I'm not going to speak about this again. This is it. I don't know what they're going to do to me after this, but this is it. I was told that men will employ every policy to make less prominent the difference between the faith of Seventh-day Adventists and those who observe the first day of the week. This is no time to hold down our colors. Enough said. My message to you is no longer consent to listen without protest to the perversion of truth. Protest against us. That's what we're doing. It's time to speak up. This thing will bring the shaking. I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy being separate from those who are daily imbibing new errors. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings. So when people preaching a message other than pillars of Adventism and three angels' messages, are invited to run meetings and camp meetings and all of these things, we are admonished, don't go. Don't go to those meetings. Stay away. If spiritual formation is going to be a basis for whatever is being taught, stay away. God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go. For unless he sends us to those meetings where error is forced home to the people by the power of the will, he will not keep us. There might be occasions when God says, go and listen to what that or that one is saying, but he will empower you to be able to do that. But he's never going to send his people to such occasions. I know of circumstances where pastors will take busloads of Seventh-day Adventist youth 
to charismatic churches to go and find out how to worship. Is there no God in Israel that we should go and inquire of the witch of Endor? We have a testing message to give and I'm instructed to say to our people, unify, unify. But we are not to unify with those who are departing from the faith. So there's a certain unity which we must strive for but unity in error is an impossibility. Christ calls for unity, but he does not call for us to unify on wrong practices. One selected messages, page 175. We cannot go along with this. Through association with the world, our institutions will become unsubstantial, unreliable, because these worldly elements introduced and placed in positions of trust are looked up to as teachers to be respected in their educating, directing and official position and they are sure to be worked upon by the spirit and power of darkness so that the demarcation becomes not distinguished between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. It's not me saying that. This is the spirit of prophecy saying our institutions will become unsubstantial unreliable if these elements come in. And they can do more damage than they can do good. No wonder John the Baptist was sent to the desert for his education. The Lord calls for a renewal of the straight testimony. But the spirit of Antichrist is prevailing to such an extent as never before. Well may we exclaim, help Lord! For the godly man seetheth, for the faithful fail from amongst the children of men. But the days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. I believe we are in the closing moments of this earth's history. And this is not my intention here to bash those that see it the other way. This is an appeal. Come to your senses. Come to your senses. Why would you die, O house of Israel? Why would you want to go down with Korah, Dayton, and Abiram? Why don't you want to live? We need divine enlightenment daily. We should pray as did David. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. God will have a people upon the earth who will vindicate his honor by having respect to all his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And what a wonderful light he's given us in the spirit of prophecy, which should be emphasized more towards the end than in the beginning, not less. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Psalms 37 verse 7. There might be extremists amongst us who say, well, can you see what this church is like? I'm leaving. No, you don't leave. This is God's church. He's the captain of the helm. And this church will go through to the kingdom and you will stay in it. And you will worship God according to his dictates and leave this to God. But you can have no fellowship with it. Get ye from the tents. Start speaking and moving in circles that believe the word of God. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, do not fret, it only causes harm, for evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So let's not fret, let's not panic, but let us pray such as never before. Amen.